Okay, so hello and good evening. Uh, welcome back to the second lecture on quantum field theory. We are continuing from yesterday and we're talking more about quantum field theory, its emergence and how things actually happened around. So that is basically the essence. And in today's video, we are going to explore a little bit more on quantum field theory as it is a long subject and we are actually eventually delving and we are targeting to go uh, deep into the uh, mathematics of quantum field theory. So uh, those who have not uh, watched my first lecture, which actually started with the evolution of quantum field theory, why we need quantum field theory, uh, I would say what was the need for quantum field theory, etc. It is there in my uh, live section list. I will also provide it in the because I just started and I came back from the college. I just thought to let, let me start quickly with the uh, session because it's already getting a time over. OK, so we would start uh, uh, with lecture two today. And uh, the basic aim of this lecture is that what we found is that there are certain uh, problems, uh, especially with the spontaneous emission, which was not recorded by Heisenberg's, uh, sorry, uh, Schrodinger's equation. So that was one of the, I would say, a basic idea that uh, we founded, the quantum field theory was founded. And eventually what happened is that this spontaneous emission, uh, which required the quantization of the classical electromagnetism, was missing in Schrodinger's equation. So we will look a little bit more on today and we will like to explore what ex exactly it is. Now, first I would like to go a little bit more deeper into what is spontaneous emission and understand a little bit more about what is called why Schrodinger's equation was unable to register the uh, spontaneous emission. So as you can see here, the first thing that uh, comes right is a basic kind of a definition of uh, you know spontaneous emission. So I have written it very clearly that spontaneous emission is the process in which a quantum mechanics, uh, quantum mechanical system such as an at atom or subatomic particle, transits from an excited energy to a lower energy state, and it emits an amount of energy in the form of a photon. So uh, I would say this is basically a kind of a definition, right? So what we see from here is that the spontaneous emission, now if you can uh, look, close, look, look closely look into this slide, you see this is the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation is basically what it is telling is a primarily concerned with the time evolution of quantum states. This is important. We'll come to that. And this emission process is not adequately captured by the Schrodinger equation, which deals with the deterministic unitary time evolution. Now, this is very important. I will tell you why it is important as I will show you in the next part. And to accurately describe spontaneous emission, you need uh, to incorporate the principles of quantum electrodynamics, which is uh, another part of quantum field theory. And spontaneous emission is a probabilistic emission. So at given any given point of time, there is a certain probability that an excited atom will definitely emit a photon. Now, this is actually what is uh, basically the spontaneous emission. Now, here is something which is very important. Now, you see here in this slide is that the Schrodinger equation, as you can see, is basically a kind of a primarily concerned with the time evolution of quantum states, right? Uh, it can describe how a quantum's wave function changes over time when it is not perturbed by external influences. This is important. Now, what is happening? Let me uh, speak a little bit. I will show the slide again. Now, what you need to understand uh, strongly is that Schrodinger equation is a time evolution equation. That means with the passage of time, say one minute, two minutes, three minutes, I'm just taking an analogy, it will evolve. The quantum system will get more complex and it will slowly evolve. This is a kind of a deterministic classical system. And this time evolution is being registered by what? By Schrodinger's equation. Now, because it is a time evolution factor, it can always come back, as I have shown over here, you can see that time reversible is a linear equation and spontaneous emission is an irreversible process. Here is the conflict. The conflict is that shorting the equation because it's a time, uh, you know, time dependent equation and it is a classical equation which is 
uh, uh, which is going on one way, but spontaneous emission is an irreversible process. Irreversible means in the way that once an electron or proton emits something and undergoes a spontaneous emission, it cannot be reverted back. So right at the bottom, you can see I have written Schrodinger equation cannot fully describe spontaneous emission because it does not uh, quantize electromagnetic field or allow the irreversible process because that is a Schrodinger equation because it is a classical equation. So it is basically a reversible process. But spontaneous emission, on the other hand, is a very much irreversible process. So this is actually what is the problem. So because it is a time reversible equa linear equation and spontaneous emission is an irreversible equation, here comes the problem or here comes the limitation of Schrodinger's equation that it is not being able to provide a spontaneous emission. Now this here, I would like to tell that uh, if you have attended my lectures on, just a second, there's a comment. Why unitary? Vishal Pandey is asking. Uh, which one is unitary? I cannot understand, uh, Vishal, if you can put it in the chat box. Now, if you have attended my uh, previous uh, uh, you know, webinar where I have been talking about general theory of relativity, why general relativity is a classical system, what is most important over here is that Schrodinger equation is a classical system. Classical system means it is time dependent, it goes in one direction and again it will come back in another direction. Right? So I, uh, I, will, I will wait for Vishal Pandey's question that why it is unitary. Which one is unitary? If you can put up Vishal, that would be uh, good to know. So what I would like to show you now is something very important is this one. Okay, this is what is called a reversible system, right? So here you see what is happening is that if I go from point one to point two, and from point two, if I go point point three, there is always a chance that from point three, I can come back to point two, right? And from point two, if there is another arrow, which is going back to point one, then there is a chance. Now, what happens if I suddenly appear at point two? Right? So a dynamical law, it must be reversible, reversible. And if the arrows are reversed, the result will still be deterministic. That means if I'm going back from 3 to 2, I can exactly tell you that from where 3, I'm going back to 2. Uh, this is very fundamental to quantum mechanics as well as quantum field theory. So when I am at point 2, you see I have written state 1 has no past. That means I cannot tell where I am coming from, where will I go. There is no state which leads to one because there is no arrow. So I cannot go back to point number one. This system is irreversible. And classical mechanics or classical system does not allow any system to be reversible. Whereas here you can see that Schrodinger's uh, equation is a time reversible linear equation. That means I can go back. On the other hand, the issue that we are dealing is it's spontaneous emission and which is an irreversible process. So what I explained in lecture one was basically a kind of an idea that why spontaneous emission happens and why uh, I would say uh, Schrodinger's equation has a limitation. Now I can really show you that because of this, because the spontaneous emission itself is uh, something which is irreversible. Once it is emitted, it is emitted. It cannot go back. Schrodinger's equation measures what is a reversible system. Now, in order to mention, uh, I mean to say, in order to uh, have a mathematical tool, which is quantum electrodynamics, uh, which will uh, help us to equip us truly to, uh, meant, uh, I would say, uh, respond to uh, spontaneous emission, we need what is called a transition rate in quantum electrodynamics. Uh, this is what I'm going to explain you. What is a transition rate in quantum electrodynamics? Uh, I won't say this is a new concept. Actually, it came from originally from Paul Dirac, and then it was, uh, you know, framed by uh, uh, Enrico Fermi, and it's called Fermi's Golden Rule. We'll just look into that. So what is a transition rate? This is important because until we know what is a transition rate, we won't be able to further understand that this transition rate is important in terms of quantum field theory. 
Okay, so here you go. So what I'm trying to tell is that this is called the Fermi's golden rule. Okay, now in quantum physics, Fermi, but but remember one thing that before Enrico Fermi, I think if, if I'm not wrong, around 10 to 15 years early, earlier, Paul Dirac actually Deter deterministic unitary time evolution, why it is called unitary. Oh, oh okay, okay, okay. Uh, deterministic time evolution, why it is called unitary? Because uh, I mean to say, if you, if you start from one particular unit, you can go back to that. And then from that particular unit, you can come uh, back to that. So it is, it is happening, uh, unitary in the sense, it is happening in one direction. You're going back, coming back. It has not got anything kind of a dualism. That is why it is called a unitary time evolution. It is proceeding the time in one unique direction. Right. So that is why it is. So for, for, for uh, quantum mechanics, we say it is a wave particle duality. So the duality comes in. Right. We shall. So I hope that that answers your question. OK. So the Fermi in quantum physics. So it is actually named after Enrico Fermi. But as I was telling you, around 10, 15 years earlier, it was Paul Dirac who actually, uh, you know, uh, has framed it. Now, what I'm trying to tell you is that you can need to pay a little bit of attention over the, this slide, uh, which I'm showing in. Now, you see here, Fermi's golden rule actually describes that cis begins with a, a eigenstate. This one is the eigenstate, which is in a Brian Decat notation of an unperturbed uh, Hamiltonian. So what is the, as I told you, that deals, this deals, all of these deals with unperturbed system. That means... There should not be any perturbation. If there is a perturbation, then uh, again, uh, things will uh, further complicate. So I am starting with an eigenstate I. I am moving to an unperturbed Hamiltonian, which is H0. And considering the effect of a perturbing Hamiltonian, which is H prime. Right? So I am starting with an eigenstate I. I am going to an, uh, of an unperturbed Hamiltonian, which is H sub 0, as I have shown you. And it considers the effect of a perturbian Hamiltonian, which is an H prime, applied to a system. Say, for example, whatever the system. Now, here you see, just a second, I, 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 I'm unable to see my screen itself. This is so small. Yeah. So this is what. Now, if the H prime, as you can see, I have written, if H prime would have been a time independent, I mean to say is time independent, then the system goes into those states in the continuum that have the same energy, right? So if uh, H prime is a time independent, then the system goes into those states in the continuum that have the same energy as well as the same initial state. Now, if uh, I, I have taken H prime as an oscillating sinusoidal function of a time, you can take anything. So if it is a oscillating sinusoidal of a function of a time, then it has got an angular fre frequency, omega, right? And the transition is its states of energies that differ, I mean to say, H bar, reduced Planck's constant, omega. Now, in, in, in both the cases, the transition probability per unit of this initial state is given by this formula. I will just explain it. it is. So it has got a final state, which you can see F, which is a final state. And it is initially and constant. Okay. Let me just explain the next part. Here you see. So first of all, this 2 pi, as you can see, it arises from the time dependent nature of the quantum uh, transition. That is quite obvious. We all know. H bar, again, is the Planck's constant. Now this F with the vertical, with H prime and I, it is basically called a matrix element. Now, matrix element, I will explain later. Those who are already aware about quantum mechanics, you already know what is a matrix system. It is basically a Brian Decat notation. And it is of which the perturbation H prime between the initial and the final states, which is rho E sub S. Now, remember what is E sub S? This is the density of states. That means the number of states of, say, so for example, a differential energy state, DE, in the infinite simial small energy E2, E plus DE of final states. So, and also remember that the transition probability is also called a decay probability. So the probability of the system in state I in initial is proportional to this one. So because the transition, uh, uh, transition probability is also called a decay probability, it has what it, it means that it has got a mean lifetime, obviously. 
So the probability of finding the system in a state I is this one, which is written at the bottom. So if you want me, I can again explain this. Fh prime I, this is the matrix element, which is in Brian Kett notation. You can go back to my quantum physics videos. I've explained in details what is the Brian Kett notation. And the perturbation is H prime between the final and the initial states. Here again, we are taking rho E sub F. This one is the density of states. We are actually considering a differential energy in the infinite simul small energy level E2 plus Di. And because the transition probability is also called the decay probability, it means it has got, it is also called mean lifetime. Okay, so we have now understood what is this transition, what I was talking that this transition is uh, what is called transition in quantum electrodynamics. And this transition is actually the problem which Schrodinger equation was unable to explain. I have also explained to you that what is this one, uh, the uh, transition QED. And prior to this, I have explained that why Schrodinger's equation being a unitary time uh, evolution, it would uh, not be able to uh, explain the spontaneous emission. Okay, Vishal is telling, can an example of eigenstate uh, be given in our classical world? Uh, example of eigenstate uh, in classical world. Uh, I need to think. Uh, okay, I will come back to this a little bit later because, uh, for example, uh, you can take a plane wave, for example. Plane wave can be an ideal example of a eigenstate, but eigenstate, eigen, these are actually something very quantum in nature. So plane wave, uh, we can say, is an eigenstate, which has a uh, kind of a momentum operator and has a specific value for the momentum. But plane waves, remember, are completely spread out in space. So the plane wave contains its, uh, I would say, all the eigenstates of the position. So the position is then completely uncertain because it spreads over, right? So that that is that is uh, something you need to be aware about, right? Okay, fine. Okay, so we have understood this. Now I will come to what I was explaining that what is quantum electrodynamics? Let us understand it briefly. Now here you see that quantum electrodynamics is basically a kind of a system which is in full agreement with quantum mechanics and special theory of relativity. It was first formulated by Dirac, as I told you, by which he explained the spontaneous emission. I was telling you that spontaneous emission, spontaneous emission cannot be explained. So here you can see that spontaneous emission can be explained. And that was basically the idea of uh, quantum electrodynamics. And the next thing is the creation and annihilation operator. Now see, creation and annihilation operators are actually mathematical operators and which has got a widespread applications in terms of quantum mechanics. So, for example, in the study of quantum harmonic oscillator, etc., there are many things. So, uh, there is a dagger sign, and you can find it out. So, creation operator increases the number of particles in a given state one by one, and its adjoint is that of the annihilation operator. And it can this Feynman uh, Feynman explained it through the Feynman diagram. I'm sorry, I have not drawn the, the Feynman diagram, but that is out. So, what happened is that Eugen Wigner, Pascal Jordan, Heisenberg. Uh, Enrico Fermi, all of them together found out what is the quantum electrodynamics is all about. I mean to say, uh, not to, they frame the quantum electrodynamics to uh, give a proper answer to spontaneous emotion, uh, emission. And not only the spontaneous emission, there were other problems because there are several other areas of quantum field theory which covers. Actually, to be very honest with you, quantum field theory is a huge area then I have to actually stop all video making and everything and I have to make only videos on quantum field theory. And to be honest, also the mathematics is quite complex. So right at this stage, what I can, what I, you can all understand from this, uh, this second lecture is that, <coughs> sorry, is that we have understood that what is a, a transition and actually why this transition happened. And now you can see all these are coming in terms of density, momentum density, energy density, overall, why in the density? Because a particular field now cannot be pointed with a particular area because it has all become a very wide space. There is a distribution and we need to find it out. Okay, so that makes the story. 
Okay, here you can see that this is a kind of a Feynman diagram, which as I've explained, right? This is, the, this is the one. So what actually happens is that there is an infinite amount of, uh, I would say, intermediate virtual processes in which one or more photons are actually absorbed and emitted. Now, for each of these processes, remember that a Feynman diagram could be drawn and described. I think you are all aware about what is a Feynman diagram. Uh, otherwise, I will later make a complete live uh, class only on Feynman diagram. So you see a photon. Go, this is actually would have been a great if there would have been an animation. But a photon actually goes from one place and time to another place and time. An electron goes from place and time. So this is the photon. This is the electron. An electron emits or absorbs a photon at a certain place. So from one place and time A to another place and time B, this is the P, this is the probability of A to B. Right. So what I'm trying to tell is that this diagram actually makes things easy. And this is the basic approach of, I would say, quantum electrodynamics. And to calculate the probability of any kind of an interactive process between electrons, photons, and whatsoever, it is a matter of first noting with Feynman diagrams all the possible ways in which the process can be constructed from the three basic elements, this one, this one, and this one. So each diagram involves calculating, involving definite rules to find the associated probability amplitude. So we are finding the probability amplitude from A to B. And again, you see at the bottom, you have I have written the probability amplitude of E, again, the electron from C to D. So that is, that is actually happening, how these things are actually interacting. This is being explained by uh, Feynman's diagram. So here is, I would say, a kind of a quick uh, uh, summary. So quantum electrodynamic is based on the assumptions that a photon goes from uh, one place and time to another place and time. These are assumptions because it is a new physical system. It is a new system. So for every new system, we need to have uh, assumptions just like any physical system. An electron goes from one place to another place and time, and an electron emits or absorbs a photon at a certain place and time. And using the amplitudes, what we do is that we calculate the probability of any complex interaction. So square of the total of the probability amplitudes. So if an event happens, have I written, via number of indistinguishable alternative processes, then its probability amplitude is the sum of the probability of amplitude of the alternatives. If a virtual process is involved, then the product of the component of the probability amplitudes. Now, see what happens here is that this uh, adding up of this probability amplitude is basically what Feynman got, actually got the Feynman sum total, Feynman integral that we call. This is how, uh, you know, things went forward. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, we, we, now you see that we have already found that what is the solution for the, uh, you know, spontaneous emission. We have found that quantum electrodynamics has been formed. We have found that we have actually, uh, things have been much more easier with uh, what you call Feynman's diagram. Now, actually, uh, what happens? Okay, let me explain you in this way. Uh, okay, let me uh, come to the sideboard. I think that will be easier for to understand. Yeah, uh, let me just quickly, uh, no, I will add to the stage. What is the present? Yeah share screen and I will share this sideboard just just to uh, demonstrate certain things very easily. Okay, so I hope you can see this uh, clearly uh, if it is visible, right? So uh, what I'm trying to tell uh, over is just a kind of a schematic diagram that say, for example, if you have got a system typical in any kind of a system, uh, let us say it is a kind of a quantum system only. And if I take a kind of a system, then all those uh, uh, electrons or any, any kind of a subatomic particles, let us make them those rounded rounded ones, right? Now, if you're trying to measure the probability of going in either way, this or that, or whatever the directions it is going. Now, obviously, these are wave functions. So, so this would be maintained by the Greek letter psi. I mean to say, it's obviously a kind of a wave function that will be denoted. Now, these wave functions or the way these things are will be going, uh, although the, there is a probability, and if I sum total of it, I get the probability amplitude. All these things are true. But these also have got a certain limitation. I mean to say, possibly there is a kind of a bar or something, something like this. And this degrees of freedom actually goes up to that level. But if we take these up to a certain level, 
then what we get is a kind of an infinity. It's a kind of an infinity. Now, the, I was telling you the other day that inf dealing with infinity is a big problem. So either it has to be a perturbative or a non-perturbative theory. So if I take all these electrons, say, for example, and any kind of, a, uh, you know, degrees of freedom, I would, yes, use the word very well, the degrees of freedom are involved. So if there are enough amount of degrees of freedom which are happening around here, then what will happen is that these, all of these things, all these electrons, all these subatomic particles, protons, etc., will tend to go towards this, the degrees of freedom and the infinity. And this infinity is a big problem. It's a big question mark. Now, how to deal with infinity? That is another a big challenge of quantum field theory. And we are coming to that when we are be dealing with uh, what is called uh, the degrees of freedom. And that is what is called uh, dealing with infinities. So the infinities and divergence, most importantly, again, there, if there is a divergence of uh, things which are going around, then that could be a problem. So the, now the question arises that how do we deal with these infinities? How do we deal with the divergence? And what is the solution for that? So here you can see that it was around 1927 when the quantum electrodynamics actually was framed by uh, Paul Dirac, right? It was during that time that, uh, 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 you know, uh, Paul Dirac uh, framed the quantum electrodynamics and in successfully explained the phenomena of spontaneous emission. I mean to say, whatever that we are actually describing is a kind of a problem, etc. that is quite easily being described, right? So now the thing is that here you can see that it is a huge success because the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle actually explains the quantum harmonic oscillators cannot remain stationary. This is what Heisenberg's uncertainty principle tells. And even in a perfect volume, there remains an oscillating electromagnetic field. Remember, even in a perfect vacuum, there remains a kind of an oscillating electromagnetic field. So quantum electrodynamics adds itself, it was a huge success. It explains both emission and absorption. Or number two, it is able to account for the scattering of photons. The scattering of photons is being explained. And the non-relativistic Compton scattering, which was also a challenge. Somehow I have not explained, otherwise the uh, things will become too much. Then uh, So that is why uh, it is being, you know, I have. So that was also a challenge that Compton scattering was not being able to explain by the classical, I would say, quantum mechanics. So that, that was also being done. So it is this vacuum fluctuation of these electromagnetic fields in the quanta, in the vacuum that stimulates this spontaneous emission. And Dirac's theory tried to understand why it was a huge success because it explained both the emission and absorption radiation of atoms by applying what is called a second perturbation theory. Anyway, so it was also able to account for the scattering of photons resonance, fluorescence, and non-relativistic Compton effect. Now, nevertheless, what I was trying to say is that the application of higher order perturbation theory was actually uh, a problem which was carrying a lot of infinities. Okay, so let us go into the next one. Okay, this is what is called a Dirac equation. Now, I am not going to explain Dirac equation in this class. I will take a special another uh, class where I, I will explain Dirac equation because Dirac equation again will take some time to explain. So what you can see is here that in 1927, what Dirac equation actually tells, let us understand an overall idea, then we will go into the mathematics class by class. So what it does it say? It actually says that number one, first of all, you need to understand it is a relativistic counterpart of the Schrodinger equation. Here I will like to take a pause again. Now you understand that I was telling you and I will show you if time permits today that why Schrodinger equation is almost classical. I will try to derive it because the sideboard is a little bit clumsy to write upon. So I have got some uh, uh, equations in latest. Let us see how things proceed. So Schrodinger equation is basically the classical counterpart which is the classical, uh, the kinetic energy and the potential energy taken together. Schrodinger equation, remember, it was not a relativistic equation as it was unable to explain what the time irreversible uh, problems like spontaneous, uh, spontaneous emission. Here comes what actually was the basic idea of Paul Dirac that it is the relativistic counterpart of the Schrodinger equation. 
and it was applicable to spin half particles. So number one, it described all spin half massive particles, I mean to say electrons and quarks. Point number two also what it does, so these are two equations, two formats of the Dirac equation, consistent with both quantum mechanics and special relativity, obviously, otherwise how will it will be a relativistic equation? And it was validated actually with the hydrogen spectrum in a completely rigorous way. There are different kinds of experiments with this equation because hydrogen is the simplest. We even solve a Schrodinger equation with the relativistic uh, hydrogen atoms. So three things, as you can see, is in what Dirac equation proves. So in order to know, you might ask that what is Dirac equation? So first understand that because Schrodinger equation was not relativistic, it was made relativistic by Paul Dirac. So we got a proper relativistic Schrodinger equation, one. Second, it, it describes all the spin-off particles, massive particles, right? Second, it is consistent, obviously, with quantum mechanics and special relativity. And third, it was actually validated in terms of experiment. The physicists saw that, okay, if we explode with it, hydrogen atoms, etc., then it obeys all the rules. So the purpose of formulating this equation was to study the relative motion of the electron and treat the atom as consistent with relativity. That, that means, obviously, the electrons are moving. There is a relativistic motion. And who is going to explain that relative, relativistic motion? Special theory of relativity. And the and how will you treat the quantum particle? That you have to treat the quantum particle it has to be consistent with the relativity. OK, so these are actually what actually is the idea of a Dirac equation. OK. Now, here comes the problems with infinities. I have explained it very simply. So quantum field theory actually was plagued. <laughs> I mean to say it has a huge amount of serious difficulties. Among them, one was the divergent conditions and it didn't fit. Now, if you ask me that what is infinity, how it came from, then I have to show a complete equation. To be very honest, I don't have, I don't remember that equation in total, but it is a big equation which eventually when it is solved, it would lead to infinity. So here you see Robert Oppenheimer actually showed in 1930 that higher order perturbative calculations, I mean to say perturbative calculation in quantum electrodynamics always result into infinite quantities, always higher order perturbation. Again, it is a perturbation, not the non-perturbative theory, right? Uh, for example, the electron self-energy and the vacuum zero-point energy of the electron and photon fields. That means it would, what was Oppenheimer's result for suggesting that computational methods during the time of Oppenheimer was not properly dealing with interactions involving photons with extremely high momenta, extremely high momentum. And why? Because during that time, this formulation was not being done when Robert Oppenheimer actually did that. So it was 20 years later, as I told you, the uh, this the the, the, uh, the that that uh, um, uh, the Fermi Dirac. Uh, sorry, the, yeah, the Fermi Golden Rule. Before Fermi Golden Rule, it was done by Dirac. So it was not until uh, I would say 20 years that that system actually uh, uh, was resulted. And here you see there is another person called Ernst Stuckelberg. So during that time, a series of papers was published between 1934 and 38. And Ernst Stuckelberg uh, established relativistically, I would say, some invariant formula of quantum field theory. But unfortunately, as you all know, that the achievements were not properly understood and recognized during that time by the quantum uh, quantum community or whatever you might tell. Right. So this was the order. So first, it was Oppenheimer, which find, who found out the problem that with very high momenta, it would result into infinity and divergent solutions, energy shift of electrons, self-energy of electrons, all this. And Stuckelberg, unfortunately, found out a relativistic quantum field theory, which was actually, I would say, uh, it was not, uh, it was not uh, properly uh, taken into account. Okay, now here comes uh, something which is called... Uh, uh, I would say, a, a S-matrix theory. I think uh, this is not yet taken into account because it was developed by, um, uh, you know, Heisenberg. And later again, S-matrix theory actually got some problems. So it moved into, so an array of mathematics, what is an S-matrix theory? It is an array of mathematical quantities that predicts what? The probabilities of all possible outcomes of a given experimental situation. 
So it metrics actually for the collision, it gives the likelihood of, so you get a kind of a matrix kind of a thing. And each of these points actually describes what type of a probability. So it's a collision occurring, whatever there's a probability. And it was during that time, this problem arose that people were unable to formulate the S matrix theory. S matrix theory itself had a problem. Heisenberg and John Wheeler knew that there was a problem. What to do with the abundant quantum field theory? That was actually happening during that time. Now here, actually, the breakthrough was around, uh, I think, 1950 or so. I have not written, maybe. So breakthrough was found in 1950 when actually this Julian Schweinger, Richard Feynman, Freeman Dyson, uh, Shinshiro Tomanga, they actually, their main idea was basically what? To replace the calculated values of mass and charge in finite though maybe and to measure it in a finite area. Remove all the infinities and get into something which is very finite. This was the main idea. So that this systematic computational procedure is what is called renormalization, which is very common in quantum physics, quantum field theory, everywhere you will find what is called a renormalization. And to that means normal things again you are renormalizing it because otherwise the general normal things which were earlier done were leading to infinity. So if the general normal things were leading to infinity, then you are, again have to renormalize it. And that is was actually basically done by Feynman, Dyson. So you know, you see that Feynman actually, uh, I would say, laid the foundation of quantum field theory. I, uh, Feynman is known for his uh, lectures and ideas in quantum physics, but he actually laid the foundation based on Feynman's diagram, etc. Today we get a quantum field theory. So you can say they are basically the father, Richard Feynman, Tomanga, Julian Schweinger, etc. Now, I will just have a glass of water. I will try to explain what is renormalization. Okay, so what is renormalization? Uh, let me explain in a very simple manner so that you can understand. So, what we can say, renormalization is a mathematical procedure. Right, simply stated, and it 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 is a way I would say it can remove remove the infinities, whatever the re, uh, infinities were there, we are going to remove that. Right. Okay. So renormalization is basically a collection of techniques, obviously mathematical techniques in quantum theory, and it actually treats infinities arising in a calculated quantity. That means you see, this is the beauty that you really cannot avoid infinities. You, you need to deal the infinities in a very controlled manner. And that is why I have written by altering of these quantities to compose it for effects of their self interactions. Okay. Okay. Now, now you see, this is a kind of a diagram, which I would like to explain you. Now, See, th these are the electron field, the positron field, the neutrino. These are actually no more particles, but they are just, this is difficult to explain. I mean to say, okay, let me again share the sideboard once. I will try to explain it in this way. Uh, I mean to say it is, uh, okay, uh, just a second. I will just uh, share, uh, where is the present? Yeah. So I would share the sideboard once. Okay, uh, let me remove this one. Right, this 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 uh, diagram we have already done it. Okay, okay. So what do we do from here? What we get from here is that all these things which we are currently dealing with. I mean, just all all those all those areas which we are dealing with. You know, these instead of particles, if you call these as particles, you know, small particles, which are particularly happening in a kind of a trend. Maybe these are electrons, particularly electrons or so. Now, in, 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 in general field theory, we point those as particles. These are all particles. That means they will have a specific behavior. I'm not saying what's the position, momentum, etc. But all of them have, would have a kind of a specific behavior. But what about these are actually excitations. These are not particles, but these are simple excitations. Now, you see, as soon as I try to move those, uh, you know, these, these particles, into something like this. These are excitations. 
So automatically, when you are watching, you will find, no, these are not particles, these are not round, these are some kind of an excitation. So if it is a typical kind of an excitation, then obviously the problem starts that I won't be able to specify a particular zone for those excitation because these are all excitation. So what I have to do, I have to take an aggregate, I have to take a density, I have to take a, um, a you know, kind of an average of all those things because they do not mention anything, but they are mere excitations. So from a particle, as soon as you are moving into the excitation stage, there are a lot of definitions which actually changes. Isn't it? There are a lot of definitions which have changed. So that is why I have showed here that renormalization actually replaces the initial, initially postulated mass and charge of an electron with the experimentally observed mass and charge. It is important. Renormalization actually replaces the initially postulated mass and charge of an electron with the experimentally observed mass and charge. Positrons as you can see here, what I have done, you see that this electron, this one at the bottom, it has got a mass and a charge. It went into a certain phase here. You can see that it is interacting with photons, positrons, whatever be it. After it comes out of the interaction, it has got a different mass and a different charge. So it started with mass M, for example, and it star started with charge E, for example, it resulted into M plus plus and whatever CV minus minus. So what I'm trying to explain is that positrons are more massive particles, obviously like protons and exhibit precisely the same observed charge, even in the presence of a much uh, a stronger interaction and more intense, uh, I would say cloud, dense clouds of virtual partic particles. So even positrons are more massive particles like protons they exhibit precisely the same observed charge as an electron, even after the interactions of the virtual particles. This is, the, this is something very important. So the first step of normalization is that where we modify the theory in such a way that the divergences actually, there are no divergences, the divergences disappear. The second stage is to take the parameter that control the amount of modification. Okay, let me go to the next slide. I think it will explain. Yeah. So first you see in order to remove these infinities, one, I am trying to explain those very complex mathematical big equations into simple English. Then we will go back to that. So first, what is the step? Step number one is that renormalization is regularization where we modify the theory. For example, we add some fields with heavy mass that this one, we have added some fields with the heavy mass. This one has got heavy mass, right? So we have added some field with the heavy mass, right? And in such a way, the divergences disappear. Second stage is what? Second stage is taking a parameter that control the amount of modification and sending it to zero. I mean, just taking a careful limit. If it is done right and the theory is renormalizable, then we can make all the divergences from the possible loop disappear. We can make all the uh, things disappear. So this is what is, uh, we call it that, what is need renormalization? Thus the war against infinities basically comes to an end. And we establish the quantum field theory, taking care of all those problems that arose. So quantum field theory is thus established. Now, here is another thing which I was, uh, I think, just a second, I will just show you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that is how the we established the quantum field theory. And it is with the invention of renormalization procedure and Feynman diagrams that quantum field theory arose a completely different network. Completely, I would, uh, that arose as a completely uh, what it is written, I cannot see because this, just a second, let me see this. Completely, complete theoretical framework, yeah. So this, I mean to say, this is not done. This is just a kind of a procedure. This is the procedure by which I have shown you that how did renormalization, et cetera, really happens. And uh, I mean to say a kind of a complete diagram, how one by one, one by one things are happening. What are the things that are taken into account? Uh, what are, I, I mean to say this is a kind of an historical walkthrough uh, up to a certain stage 
that these infinities are uh, arising, the S matrix theory, then the renormalization, the heavy particles, etc., which are coming. Now, I have actually omitted, I mean to say, I will take it up in the next class. I am not being able to come on first and second because a lot of, uh, you know, teachers who are coming from Thailand, uh, from different parts of Kerala, Bangalore, and we have got a meeting on the first and second. So I would be, I think I would be able to either come online Friday or Saturday. I will just tell you, either it will be a Friday or a Saturday. Now, what is not done, this is a kind of a basic idea we are going step by step. I hope you are enjoying. Vishal Pandey is the only one who has commented. So you can also comment later or whatever you like. Now, one thing is what I was constantly telling is that you need to understand the classical, uh, classical mode of Schrodinger's equation. And I'm going to show you that through a kind of a simple mathematical derivation and why it is classical. Only then you will understand that why Paul Dirac use the Dirac equation in order to turn that relativist uh, classical Schrodinger equation into relativistic equation. And we are also going to deal with standard model and the different gluons, quarks, etc. because these interactions are important. Uh, I have already made the lecture, you know, kind of a ready that would be in the next, uh, this is lecture two. So lecture three would be a little bit more interesting on the land, uh, the, the standard models, their fundamental interactions, uh, the weak force, strong force, how they interact. I, I think that is also, you know, uh, an important aspect of quantum field theory. So that's all for today's uh, live session. I hope you are enjoying. I would really appreciate if you put on, put on more comments, if you really cannot understand anything also you can do. So either Friday or Saturday, I will come online. I am not creating a kind of a pre-live session because I really don't know when I will be able to come. Maybe there's a somewhere, maybe I've got my own lectures because I provide webinars and discussion on mathematics on overseas countries also in different other parts of the world where maybe I have to work at two o'clock at night when it is morning. So what happens is that and also the YouTube videos, a lot of things coming up. So that is why I'm not putting that it will be scheduled on such and that I make a promise and I, I don't like that I should break my promise. So the, the basic idea is that this is the second lecture of quantum field theory. Remember, we have not gone into the real mathematics. We are just going a kind of a walkthrough. But uh, do you think that this walkthrough is good enough? Are you getting a kind of a historical and a complete idea? What are the problems? What are the solutions? Why this theory? Why that theory? I need to know more from you. So please do let me know how things are going and how uh, things are taking up. I will be doing a little bit more mathematical equations on Schrodinger, etc., from the next class onwards. So as you see, the sideboard, it is a little bit difficult to write. And even if I write, it is not very clear. So I will use the latex code and make the equations prior, put it up over there, and then I will start. Also, it is not that I am only making a live stream on quantum field theory. There will be live stream on tensor calculus. There will be live stream on the philosophy of uh, physics and mathematics. And there will be live stream on, obviously, my favorite subject, Einstein's general theory of relativity. So we, I will keep on keep you updating one by one. So please do give me feedback, comment. How do you like what you do not like, what you want further to be incorporated in the live session? Because I'm very passionate and I really like how things should be going. So please do let me know. So dear, tomorrow and day after tomorrow, there will be no live stream. I will try to come either on Friday or Saturday, depending upon the business and the situation. And obviously, your comments always motivate me. So that's all. Second lecture is being done. We will go ahead next with the third lecture. Thank you very much.